Today I'm going to, I will be discussing a reinterpretation of passages from book three of the histories in the context of the Byzantine inscription, which was a royal declaration of Darius I carved onto a mountainside in Kermanshah province, in which the king details how he came to the throne after Cambyses' death and the defeat of the Median pretender Gaumata. Um, and then also how he overcame empire-wide revolts in the first year of his reign from 522 to 521 BCE. Many of you will be familiar with Darius's inscriptions as probable source material for passages in the histories relating to Cambyses' actions in Egypt, Smerdis's murder and the rise of pseudo Smerdis, as well as Darius's eventual accession to the throne. Assessment of the relationship between the histories and the Byzantine inscription is usually confined to assessing passages 30 to 38 and 61 to 88 of book three against Darius's version of the same events, which is contained in a few passages in the prologue of the Byzantine inscriptions. Uh, also um, one, two passages at the end, uh, 10 to 15 and 68 to 69. Herodotus's account is much closer in historical content at this point to the account engraved at Mount Byzantine than any of the other extant ancient accounts, which has suggested that Herodotus was working from a version of Darius's official account. But despite the historical correspondences between Herodotus's and Darius's accounts of events before Darius's accession, in his narrative of Darius's early reign, Herodotus doesn't mention the empire-wide revolts, which Darius uses a majority of the Byzantine narrative to describe, which seems to contradict the thesis that Herodotus was working from a version of the Byzantine inscription because the revolts were the primary subject matter of Darius's declaration. Between sections 16 and 51, Darius tells of 20 battles in which the Persians were successful in defeating all the rebel kings who arose to challenge his rule in diverse parts of the empire. This part of the inscription provides not only historical details about the early years of Darius's reign, he, the king also used it to communicate ideological tenets of Achaemenid imperial ideology especially relating to the use of violence and the relationship between the king and his subordinates, the Persian elite, who were his main competition for the crown. Herodotus covers no such historical events, with the possible exception of the Babylonian siege led by Zephyrus at the end of book three. However, I think that in the later part of book three, he incorporates, Herodotus that is, incorporates the major themes from the Byzantine inscriptions, uh, which are Darius's relationship with his subordinates and the use of violence, while telling stories which were for the most part of greater relevance to a Greek audience. Before discussing the passages, we should um, consider how Herodotus might have got to know about a text carved on the side of a mountain in Kermanshah. In the first place, it's very unlikely, if not impossible, that Herodotus derived his information from the mountainside itself. The monument was placed high on a cliffside so that the inscription was illegible. There are no indications in the histories that Herodotus visited the monument or eastern parts of the Persian Empire. He doesn't claim to have done so, and he doesn't provide descriptions of places or monuments in Persia, as he does, for example, for Egypt. It's possible that he knew a version of the inscription because it was circulated in portable format around the empire. Darius tells us himself that this was so in the inscription and fragments of a Babylonian version of the Byzantine monument carved on a smaller stele were discovered in Babylon along with fragments of an Aramaic version on papyrus at Elephantine. So there is a possibility that Herodotus derived his information from, one of, from a further version like one of those circulated around the western parts of the empire. In 1907, Wells proposed that Herodotus had a Persian informant for his Persian history and suggested that this was Zephyrus the Younger, the grandson of Zephyrus the Elder, who we'll meet again later. Munson suggested more cautiously that Herodotus may have had a range of Persian informants 
but it, that it's very likely that Zapyrus the Younger was the informant for Herodotus' story about the recapture of Babylon. For other stories, she suggested, Herodotus may have had information from a range of informants from among the Persian elite. David also noted that Herodotus's early Median and Persian logoi from Astyagis' reign until Darius's accession look very clearly to have been influenced by his knowledge of Achaemenid monuments, especially Byzantine, and oral accounts from informants who had an insider's view of events, the Persian elite. Beckman, writing on the possible sources for Herodotus's stories about the death of Cyrus the Great, noted that a majority of Achaemenid propaganda, among which we will count the Byzantine inscription, was aimed at an audience of elite Persians who had the most influence in political affairs. And my own analysis of the Byzantine inscription, um, which I wrote for my PhD project, suggested that this elite audience was more important than lesser Persian or non-Persian subjects. And I'll just come back to that later. Overall, I think it's reasonable to suggest that the most likely scenario is that Herodotus did have contact with an informant from among the Persian elite, who was familiar with a version of the inscription based on the one carved on the mountainside at Byzantine, um, and that the version that he heard sounded like the version carved on the mountainside at Byzantine. So today, so now I'm going to discuss passages from the end of book three, following Darius's accession, which have been so far overlooked in scholarship about connections between Herodotus and Byzantine, and which I believe can be used to justify a view of Herodotus's strong familiarity with the inscription's content. I'll start with the story of book three, which is most obviously related to the battle narratives of the Byzantine inscriptions. This is the story of Zapyrus's siege of Babylon, with which book three ends. According to Herodotus, Babylon revolted as soon as Darius took the throne and had been preparing to do so for the whole duration of the Magus, Magus rule. The city was under siege by the Persians for a year and seven months before Zapyrus, son of Megabysus, came up with a plan to help the king capture the city. He decided that the only way to take Babylon was to mutilate himself by cutting off his nose and ears, shaving his head and flogging himself. He then approached the king with his plan. First, Zapyrus would go to Babylon claiming to be a defector from the Persian side because he had been unfairly mutilated by the king. Once he had found his way in, Darius was to dispatch Persian troops for three confrontations, 1,000 troops in the first instance, 2,000 in the second, and 4,000 in the third. Zapyrus would lead the Babylonians to victory in each of these engagements, and in a fourth engagement would open the gates to the Persians, and so they would recapture Babylon. They carried out the plan to the letter, and Darius had 3,000 of the most prominent Babylonians impaled around the city afterwards, though he showed clemency to the rest of the Babylonians. In the Byzantine inscriptions, Darius tells of two revolts in Babylonia. The first under Nadintu Bel lasted for six weeks before it was put down by Darius. Babylon was recaptured and the revolt leader and his men were put to death by impalement. The second revolt lasted for less than two months and was put down by a subordinate of Darius called Vindafana. And after this, the rebel leader Araku and his followers were also put to death by impalement. Even if these revolts are counted together as one, which they weren't actually, they span a year from late October 522 until the end of November 521. So all in all, not as long as Herodotus's year and seven months. In the Byzantine inscriptions, neither revolt, revolt involves Zapyrus either or his father Megabysus, who does appear as one of the conspirators at the end of the inscription. Overall, the Babylonian siege in the history shares so few details in common with those in the, Bibli in the Byzantine inscription that it's unwise to assign its source to either of the Babylonian revolts Darius tells about. Because of this, and because of several elements of Herodotus's story, which appear to be a parodic reinterpretation of Darius's battle narratives, I think that it was more likely constructed with the whole of Darius's battle narratives from the Byzantine inscription in mind. <clears throat> 
and especially the most and this is shown especially through his use Herodotus's use of the most formulaic element. These are the passages from the story in which Herodotus outlines the progress of the siege. In line with Zapyrus' plan, Darius dispatches 1,000 Persian troops who are defeated and slaughtered, then a further 2,000 who are defeated and slaughtered, and finally the 4,000 who are also defeated and slaughtered before the next batch of troops are let into the city and achieve victory for the Persians. The construction of the battle narratives in the Zapyrus story is very similar to Darius's own battle narratives in the inscription. This, is, this example is Darius's description of the battles between his subordinate Dadashu and the Eratians, but could easily be replaced with descriptions of most of the other battles in the inscription. For the military engagements, Darius usually, though not always, gives only details of the date and place of the battle, the fact that the Persians were victorious, along with some casualty figures, and the execution of the leaders where relevant. Any further description is usually missing, and the exceptions to this are when Darius himself goes into battle. In short, Herodotus appears to have based his descriptions on a knowledge of Darius's narrative formulation in the Byzantine inscription, though with significant alterations. And these alterations include, of course, the fact that the Persian troops were repeatedly slaughtered during these engagements, where the Byzantine inscription gives no casualty figures for Persian losses, only for their enemies. But otherwise, in a way, Herodotus's use of casualty figures is distinctly Byzantinian, as in the Akkadian and Aramaic versions of the inscription, Darius insistently gives casualty figures for enemies, as well as impalement figures after every engagement. And the table on the slide shows the casualty figures as far as they've been reconstructed, just to demonstrate the point of how many there are. The impalement figures in Herodotus's version are what drew me to examine the Zapyrus story in more detail in the first place, as the Byzantine inscription is the only Persian extant evidence for the use of mass impalement as a punishment for the leaders of revolts against the empire. In fact, for all that we know about Greek fascination with Persian punishment practice, mass impalement doesn't appear regularly. Herodotus's reference is therefore quite unique. In the Byzantine inscriptions, mass impalement is usually used against tens of enemy troops rather than thousands, um, as the reconstructed figures on the slide show. But Darius's use of impalement, um, by his own admission in the inscription, is a distinct escalation of the use of impalement in the ancient Near East. According to the available evidence, which suggests that even the Neo-Assyrian kings, who are famed for their use of terrible punishments against their enemies, didn't use mass impalement on this scale. But overall, in, his use of in Herodotus's use of casualty and impalement figures, he evokes strongly familiarity with the Byzantine inscription. Um, according to the Byzantine inscriptions as well, Darius delegated a majority of the military offensives between 522 to 521 to his subordinates and only attended four out of 20 battles personally. This goes against what we are used to from rulers of the ancient Near East in the first millennium, who would usually credit themselves with the military achievements without acknowledging the role of any subordinates, as in this extract from an inscription of Sennacherib, in which he single-handedly defeats the Edomites and Babylonians along with their allies, using the rhetorical device of the first person. In the Byzantine inscriptions, Darius rhetorically stresses that his subordinates were not autonomous agents or royal surrogates, but he instead presents them as obedient extensions of his own power everywhere in the empire. The overall effect of this is to assure his audience that Persian power reaches into every corner of the empire, where the, even where the king isn't present, and at the same time to educate the elite about correct behavior within the imperial hierarchy. He achieves this effect by using commands within the inscription. Each time one of his subordinates confronts a rebel leader, he tells them, go and defeat the rebel troops who do not obey me. And after their successes, he claims them for his own by saying things like, this is what I did in Persia, 
even though he didn't and wasn't there. And as well as my troops defeated the rebel troops, although they didn't, somebody else's troops did. He also adds, during the rebellions of the Euratians and Medians, freeze frame moments, which are um, an example is on the bottom, in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, uh, where his subordinates defeat the rebels, but then wait for the king to arrive to finish the job. Herodotus's siege of Babylon departs from Darius's descriptions because of Zopirus's centrality in the success of the Persians against the Babylonians. According to Herodotus, Zopirus conceives of the whole plan of attack against Babylon and explains this to Darius in a scene in which he, a subordinate, gives Darius, the king, his orders. Darius never admits to such a situation in the Byzantine inscriptions. Direct speech is a rarefied commodity, reserved for the king himself and for disobedient rebel leaders. The subordinates never speak, and to do so would signal their disobedience to Darius and therefore their demise. Um, in the inscription, rebels use a lot of speech to claim the kingship, but they also use speech when they're going into war, uh, rarely, um, but for that reason is quite remarkable. Um, in the Elamite version of the inscription, the Euratians march into war and they're said to chant together three times, let's make war, and after doing this each time they're also defeated. Um, the Persian rebel Vahiyaz Data has a kind of exceptional uh, instance of direct speech as well, where he gives a command to his, own, to his Persian troops to defeat Darius's because they don't obey Vahiyaz Data, and shortly after he is defeated and impaled. So his, just for reference, his command is a kind of inversion of Darius's command, go and defeat the rebel troops who do not obey me. A further distinctive aspect of Zopirus's plan in Herodotus is that facial mutilation precedes all of these events. In the Byzantine inscriptions, Darius mutilates the faces of his Median enemies, the worst offenders against the empire, whose actions were the most far-reaching in their effects. Herodotus's story about the self-mutilation of a fanatically loyal follower of Darius is a striking inversion of the use of facial mutilation in the inscriptions, therefore. And discussion of facial mutilation also leads well into an earlier episode in book three, which is about the fate of Interfernes at 118 to 119. Interfernes, we are told, lost his life shortly after the uprising against the Magus for an act of violence. He had approached the palace gates to speak with the king, but having been denied access, he violently mutilated the guards by cutting off their noses and ears with his dagger. Suspecting that Interfernes was planning a coup, Darius had him and his whole line of male relatives imprisoned and executed. The story of Interfernes' actions, or rather the way that Herodotus tells the story and his execution, reflects a central tenet of, royal, of Achaemenid royal ideology, which is entrenched in the narrative of the Byzantine inscriptions, that corporal punishment was a royal prerogative. In the inscriptions, this is communicated via the fact that Darius carries out the majority of the corporal punishments. In all other cases where his subordinates execute rebels, we are not told the means. This with the exception of an impalement carried out by Vindafana, whose Greek name is Interfernes. So the act of violence which Herodotus tells us Interfernes was executed for was not simply unjustly mutilating the guards, but for usurping a royal privilege and therefore leading Darius to believe that he wished to place himself above the king. Overall, the story of Interfernes is evocative of the insecurity of the king's position within the Persian elite, as is the story of Zopirus' siege of Babylon. The prominent role of the subordinates in the Byzantine inscriptions does initially suggest this, though further analysis reveals the myriad ways in which Darius tried to temper the impression of his subordinates' military valour and how indispensable they were in regaining control of the empire between 522 and 521. And Herodotus introduces the king's relationship with his subordinates also in the story of Aroites' punishment. Aroites was the evil satrap of Sardis, who had been in power since Cyrus appointed him. 
He didn't help when the empire was in turmoil during the reign of the Magus, and he also killed Polycrates by some unmentionable means and later crucified his body, as well as killing some of the king's messengers and some more elite Persians. Darius decided to punish Aroites, so Herodotus says, for his use of intolerable violence. So the Aroites story is also implicitly linked with the story of Interferni's execution, as both these men were punished for the use of violence, which is supposed to be a royal prerogative. And when I talk about violence as a royal prerogative, essentially what this seems to mean is that the king has the right and the means to carry out legitimate violence, but nobody else does, unless he sanctions it. According to Herodotus, rather than approaching Aroites in open war, Darius called together a meeting of the Persian elite and asked them to volunteer to bring down Aroites. 30 men volunteered and Bagaeus was chosen. Besides the involvement of Darius' subordinates in this plan, um, which I think was drawn from the Byzantine narrative, the story of Aroites' punishment is also linked to the inscription via the plan that Bagaeus conceives. So as I mentioned earlier, speech is used carefully in the, in the Byzantine inscription to emphasize the king's importance and the obedience of his subordinates. In the Aroites story, none of Darius's subordinates speak either, except when they're vying amongst themselves for the task, when Herodotus says that they quarreled amongst each other, but none of them expressed anything distinctly. After he's chosen for the task, Bagaeus continues to be silent, um, and, but he uses the king's speech to persuade Aroites' men to kill him. He has some letters written in the name of the king and has the royal secretary read them aloud when he gets to Aroites' court. So um, in the Aroites story, despite Darius' reliance on his subordinate, Bagaeus is not represented as an autonomous agent, but as a vehicle for the king's will, which is very like how subordinates are represented in the Byzantine inscriptions. And the narrative formulation of this part of the Aroites story in which the letter is read and the guards, the soldiers immediately carry out the command is very like that found in the Byzantine inscriptions where the king gives an order and it appears to have been followed instantaneously by his subordinates. These are Darius' command, commands to his subordinate Vindafana during the Second Babylonian Rebellion. Darius says, go and defeat the rebel troops who do not obey me, and Vindafana immediately goes to Babylon. Darius then says, as to Araku and the nobles who are with him, impale them, and Vindafana goes immediately impales Araku and his followers. Obviously, the speed with which this all appears to happen doesn't reflect the timing it would have taken to muster troops and march to Babylon or erect stakes and impale rebels on them. But the similarities in narrative formulation, which were also seen earlier in Zephyrus' siege of Babylon, offer more compelling evidence for Herodotus's knowledge of the official version of events and one which was very like that written on the mountainside at Byzantine. The final episode I want to comment on briefly this evening are the events in Samos after Polycrates' murder. Following Polycrates' murder, Samos was being ruled by Meandrius, whose proposition of democratic rule had been rejected by the Samians. Darius sent an expeditionary force to Samos, led by Otanes, who ended up making a truce with, truce with Meandrius and his supporters for them to leave the island. However, a half-insane brother of Meandrius called Charileus persuaded him not to let the Persians get away with all of this unscathed and issued weapons to all the mercenaries on Samos, who attacked and killed the noble Persians who were parading on the island in their litters. As a result, Atanis orders his men to kill any Samian they found in contravention of Darius's orders not to kill or enslave anyone while they were recapturing Samos. Here again, Darius sends a subordinate to take care of military matters on his behalf. And in this case, Darius also orders Atanis to take his orders from Seleucon once they reach Samos. So in each of these four episodes, the Siege of Babylon, uh, 
from the siege of well the siege of Babylon was it? Um, the Interfernes incident and the punishment of Aroites. Uh, Herodotus incorporates some comment on the relationship between the king and his subordinates, especially when it comes to military matters and the use of violence. The massacre of the Persian nobles is also notable in this story as a reflection of several instances in the Byzantine inscription in which rebellious nobles are executed en masse in the aftermath of their revolts. And I, here I give a couple of examples from the inscription on the slide. This is the second instance of elite killing in the Samos story. Prior to this, another of Meandrius's brothers murdered a group of noble Samians to make it easier for him to take over the government after Meandrius died. For me, it's difficult not to read these incidents in conjunction with the killing of elite Babylonians at the end of book three, the 3,000 who were impaled, as a comment on the elite killing Darius boasts about in the Byzantine inscriptions, and specifically about the use of elite massacre as a means to secure power. So to conclude, what I really wanted to achieve this evening was to communicate some of the ways that I think Herodotus engaged with the Byzantine inscriptions on the level of imperial ideology, apart from the historical engagement in the earlier accounts of Cambyses and Smerdis's reigns and the conspiracy against Smerdis. My Herodotus Byzantine interpretation, which is still in, a, in kind of fetal stages, has focused on the stories in the later part of book three in conjunction with battle narratives in the Byzantine inscription and especially on the way that Herodotus adapted Darius's reliance on his subordinates to secure the empire during the crisis of 522 to 521, as a significant departure from what we're used to in inscriptions of ancient Near Eastern rulers of the first millennium. In Herodotus's stories about events in Darius's early reign, against the narrative of the Byzantine inscription, the king appears unduly reliant on his subordinates, He's reliant on them, especially in the stories of Aroites punishment, uh, the events on Samos and Zephyrus' siege of Babylon, to the extent of having them not only carry out military action on his behalf, but even working out strategies to take down seditious elements within the empire. What is also interesting in some of the episodes I've discussed is the appearance of the use of violence as something that needs to be controlled which is another ever-present theme in the Byzantine inscriptions. According to Herodotus, Interfernes and Aroites are both due for punishment or must be done away with because of their use of violence. And this is familiar from the Byzantine inscriptions in the control Darius exerts over his subordinates' use of violence and in the punishments inflicted on the rebel leaders whose violence is deemed to be out of control. Finally, Although I haven't presented the episodes in the order in which they appear in book three, I think it may be possible to see how Herodotus's narrative at the end of book three moves closer and closer in ideological as well as historical subject matter as book three proceeds, culminating with a Babylonian siege, which appears, according to my interpretation, as a sub subversive Herodotian take on certain formulaic elements of the Byzantine inscriptions. And overall, this is very good evidence that Herodotus had some contact with a version of events which was very closely related to the Byzantine inscription itself, as we know it. And the evidence of this can be found beyond Darius's accession.